was out, I went to law school, went to night school, worked my way through there, hated it, got out, by this time I'm like 28. Now I get another job offer to work as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn. That's for like $27,000. That <laughs> now I'm 70 grand in the hall. The guys who are auto mechanics who I went to high school with are making a fortune. They think I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> I'm, college. I'm like I'm educating myself into poverty. And, uh, Also, I have to tell the audience, there's a lot of spoilers in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> this season two has been off the air since. Uh, yeah. If they haven't seen it, they've been So, you know. Yeah. Uh, but um, so, so tell us where you are now. Like, you're, you're in the third season. We are exactly midway through shooting season three. Uh, we'll, we're shooting our seventh episode out of 12, so a little more than uh, halfway done. We'll wrap shooting at the end of September and uh, we'll also premiere in September. So as we're editing the final episode, the uh, first episodes will be on, on TV. And, and do you have a plan when you start that you know will go all the way through? Or do you... uh, all the way through the series? Yeah, like, no, the, partly through the season, but I mean like you obviously ended the season with a big dramatic moment. Right. Did you know starting out that moment would come at the end? I wasn't entirely positive that moment was going to be at the end of season two. I always knew that moment would happen, but in the early plotting of season two, it became apparent that that was the only logical way to end the season in the sense of, or, or I should say, truthful way to end the season. Um, you know, we wrestled with the idea of killing Jimmy, who's obviously a major character on the show, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, the way we set up the story, the idea that uh, of Nucky's betrayal, and uh, also this goes back to the pilot. You know, Jimmy himself is the one who told Nucky, basically, if you're going to be in, a, in this business, you can't be half a gangster anymore, and you're going to eventually have to cross that line into being a full killer to survive. And um, the payoff was, I knew at some point he would be killing Jimmy. But anything short of that happening to me felt, for lack of a better way to describe it, like a TV show. Mm -hmm. Something you generally do on a network show. Right. And, you don't um, kill your big characters. No, you don't kill your big characters. You, you basically, it's a lot of wish fulfillment for the audience, and um, you know, they, they in general try to avoid anything that would um, defy expectations in that way. So in a way, every time I kept every time I kept feeling false for me, I kept going back to the idea, this is something we have to do. Instead of making it easy for ourselves, let's make it more difficult for ourselves as storytellers. And uh, it, was a, it was a very big decision, obviously, but it's one um, absolutely convinced was the right decision. And, 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 and you have freedom in this kind of storytelling on cable yeah. that you wouldn't have. I mean, right. you're, although you have an interesting situation because you have real historical characters. Right. You can't kill them at a minute. No, <laughs> although I, I, I kiddingly once said to Vincent Piazza, uh, the actor who plays Lucky Luciano, that I said, you know, because he, he said that, he's, well, you can't kill me. I said, but in season four, we can reveal that you're actually an imposter. You're not the real Lucky Luciano. <laughs> <laughs> and it's he, he kind of blanched. And I said, oh, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, that's uh, that's at least, although Quentin Tarantino did it uh, to Adolf Hitler. I think he killed him in a movie theater and <laughs> that's true, Bastards. Yeah. That seems yeah. to work okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about the history angle of this. I mean, was this a time, a period that you were very interested in? Uh, I was always a fan of history, uh, interested in history. Um, the, the genesis of the project was that HBO in 2007, as I was wrapping up on Sopranos, gave me this book, Boardwalk Empire, which is essentially a history book, the history of Atlantic City. And they said, why don't you take a look at it and see if you think there's a TV series in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and it really spanned the history of the town from the mid-19th century, when it was a mosquito-infested swamp, until the present day, which is now a mosquito-infested swamp at casinos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the time period that really jumped out at me was, was the Prohibition era. And the, the town had been run by a guy named Nucky Johnson, who we fictionalized as Nucky Thompson. And he was essentially you know, very close in, in a lot of ways to what we have now with Steve Buscemi. He was a corrupt politician who got involved with gangsters during Prohibition. He ran a town right on the ocean. And uh, it was just this incredible era uh, that really hadn't been explored a lot on TV. Uh, the Untouchables in 1960 okay. is really the most famous version of that. Uh, they did a syndicated version of that show in the 80s, but I don't think it was very popular. Uh, but aside from that, really, you had the Warner Brothers gangster movies. And this was really an area that was ripe for dramatization. And uh, also, there were just so many parallels to then and now. Um, the illegal alcohol business almost lifts 
perfectly as a template for the illegal drug business today. Uh, it was really the single, uh, the Volstead Act was the single most important event in terms of creating what's now known as organized crime. It made millionaires out of gangsters overnight. Uh, so many uh, issues in terms of the women's movement, um, right. it just it, corruption, big business controlling things, just uh, corruption in politics. It's sort of really, if you just switch the names around, you think you're reading today's paper. And uh, the fact that it also felt very modern back in 1920, which is over you know 90 years ago now, really looks pretty much like today. Mm -hmm. You know, the way people dress, they drive cars, they go to movies, they speak on telephones. It's pretty close to what we. So it's, it's felt very relatable as well. Now, does the history limit you in some ways? I mean, is it a challenge? I, I assume you have to do research developments. And sure. I, I, and you put, like, Al Capone together. Right. And, and when I first saw it, I thought, well, that, that probably didn't happen. But it did happen. Right, he, yeah. He, he did, in fact, have a Atlantic City connection. Yeah. So are you, are you relatively faithful to the... I'm faithful to the spirit of the characters and the, the general history. For example, like... I knew Al Capone did spend a great deal of time in Atlantic City, did know the real Nucky. Al Capone's boss, Johnny Torrio, was actually friendly with Nucky. So, therefore, they had traveled to, to, from Chicago to Atlantic City and vice versa. So, once I knew that Capone really was in that world, I, then I felt I had the, the fictional license to then say he may have met a guy like Jimmy Darmody and they may have had a relationship. So, as long as it's true to the spirit of the history, I'm okay doing it. And everything you see on the show is accurate in that sense. Another example, Arnold Rothstein was yeah. exonerated uh, of the, the scandal, the World Series fixing scandal at the end of 1919. You don't, he obviously paid somebody off. You don't know how that actually came about. So I thought, all right, well, it, who's to say it wasn't through Nucky, Nucky Johnson or Nucky Thompson in our case? And so same thing. It's, it played out the same way, but I involved one of our And Luciano? Same thing. Luciano actually, um, even later into his life, uh, had been trying to cut a deal with Nucky Johnson to be the exclusive importer of alcohol from Atlantic City uh, for years. So same thing. Through his connection with Rostin, got to know Nucky pretty well. How about Luciano's problem? That is something that I you kind of inferred. Well, oh, I, I, yeah. you know, in, in Luciano's biography, he said that he intentionally got himself infected with gonorrhea as a way of staying out of World War One, And then, uh, which, uh, there's no cure for this disease, which was pretty horrific. Actually, they did sulfur treatments, and we actually depicted that on the show. But also in his, in his book, it said that he passed up being with a lot of women in his life because he sort of felt, uh, occasionally he would feel pains, and he thought he, he didn't want to spread the disease, etc. And I thought to myself, this is a guy who's this ruthless killer, and now suddenly he's so sensitive that he doesn't, he's really worried about uh, Seems personal like hygiene. <laughs> so I, what I took from that is that uh, this guy had sexual dysfunction, mm -hmm. and, and I felt like I could, I could explore that. And then, of course, you know, Jillian cured him of that. <laughs> so. uh, did you... Ever go to Atlantic City? I mean, oh, yeah. we did this show. Yes, yeah, so I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, and as a you know, like once probably hit nineteen or so, there's casinos open down there. So we would go once every six weeks. So my friends and I would drive down there and uh, just spend time. I, I knew a little about the history of the town, but nowhere near as much as I came to know now, of course. But uh, it's a completely different place than right. it was. Is there any? Have you heard anything from like Nookie Johnson's family? No, I don't think Nucky really had a family. I'm sure I would hope I would have heard from him by now. I mean, partly that's one of the reasons I fictionalized the name from Johnson to Thompson. I thought I want to be able to take this character places where I'm not sure the real Nucky went. And if I wanted to make him a murderer, I don't know that the real Nucky ever killed anybody. And I didn't want to take that license with somebody, even though it's you know, a character with 100 years old. I just didn't think that was fair. Um, so it's Nucky, but it's not Nucky. The other thing, too, when I went down, we went down to do one of our early research trips in Atlantic City, by which I mean drink and gamble. <laughs> uh, I stopped a couple of people uh, who were lifelong Atlantic City natives and said, have you ever heard of Nucky Johnson? And nobody had heard of the guy, mm -hmm. which is really incredible. That's, based on my research there, it's like not hearing of Donald Trump yeah. today. Yeah. It's everybody knew him. He controlled that city absolutely uh, and for, years, for decades, for, yeah. decades. Mm -hmm and is forgotten. Um, there's maybe now a small plaque, and now with the popularity of the show, people now, now every, oh, I knew Nucky, I talked to him. Those people coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. I, early on, nobody had any idea who that was. You know, but you do borrow, I mean, he was a, 
a fancy dresser, uh, he always wore a red carnation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of touches that yeah. really do sound like the real guy. Yeah, it's, you know, again, it's it, it's knocky, but it's not knocky. Mm -hmm. You know, just a couple of letters different. How about the Kelly McDonald character? That, um, the storyline stemmed from just a, an introduction in Nelson Johnson's book. He, he just did a little passage illustrating about the type of guy Nucky was. And he fictionalized a little story about a local uh, housewife who comes to Nucky to ask her for money for her husband who's out of work. And I just took that moment and just went to the races with it. And I thought, well, who is this woman? What if that woman were married to an abusive husband? And what if Nucky, you know, I created this backstory for Nucky that didn't really exist. And it just really grew from there. Well, look, actually, his wife did die. Not his wife did die, yeah, tuberculosis. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you mentioned a, a little bit about being from Brooklyn, and I'm from Brooklyn, too, so... Brooklyn! That's, that's good. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, so tell us, like, a little bit of becoming uh, a writer. Now, I think you were a lawyer first, right? I was a lawyer, yeah. I was, I was one of the worst lawyers ever. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I, I realized that early on. Um, I had a, a very circuitous route to being a, a, to becoming a writer. I grew up in Brooklyn, as you said. Uh, I actually went to a vocational high school. Where I originally started to be an auto mechanic. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of the worst high schools in Brooklyn. Um, what was it? It was called William B. Grady Vocational High School. It was in Brighton Beach near Coney Island. Yeah. And uh, to give you an idea... Can you I, yeah, I can fix a car circa 1979. I think we all had to change oil. Um, but to give you an idea of how uncollege oriented this place was, in my senior year of high school, this is 1978, uh, when New York was just in the midst of a horrible fiscal crisis, we, in senior English, we read Death of the Salesman from September until June. I sw <laughs> swear to God, that was senior English. <laughs> so, and I read it the first night, and my best teacher, hold down now. <laughs> go. Uh, we didn't do anything. So I was not prepared to go to college at all. The idea of college was even on my radar. I, I graduated from high school, I moved out of my mother's house, I was in the delicatessen business. That got pulled out from under me by the guys I worked with who were much older. I finally realized I really need to go to college and sort of make something myself. I, I stumbled on NYU. I told them I wanted to major in medieval history because I figured that would cut my chances you know, down. I wasn't really competing with anybody else. Never took a medieval history class. I kind of snuck in there. And um, I had a high school teacher who used to make us write short stories on Fridays. And she told me once that she thought I was a good writer. And that sort of stayed with me. And I thought, all right, well, maybe I'll take journalism classes. And this, again, sounds horribly naive, but it is the God's honest truth. I did not know that NYU taught film and television classes. And here it is the preeminent yeah. place in the world. I was accepted to the School of Liberal Arts, and I thought that's the entire college. I didn't realize that two blocks away was the business school and the film school and the medical school. Again, this, you got to put yourself in the mindset of a dopey kid from Brooklyn who was, was an auto mechanic. So I thought, all right, well, this is the college. So I studied journalism, had a professor who uh, was really trying to get me to pursue that, and I was working my way through school as a doorman. And uh, when it came time to graduate, he, he set me up with an interview, and uh, they told me that it was an interview with the Associated Press, and he said that the starting salary was $14,000 a year. I was making almost twice that as a doorman. I said, well, this is ridiculous. It's $40,000 in the hole of student loans, and now I'm going to take a 50% cut from a doorman job. I said, I, I can't do this. For me, your job, a good job was one that paid a lot of money, and the only two jobs I knew, or thought I knew that paid a lot of money, were doctor and lawyer. Doctor was out, I went to law school, went to night school, worked my way through there, hated it, got out, but this time I'm like 28. Now I get another job offer to work as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, that's for like that twenty-seven thousand dollars. <laughs> now seventy grand in the hall. The guys who are auto mechanics who I went to high school with are making a fortune. They think I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> go to college. I'm like I'm educating myself into poverty, and uh, I have no choice but to take the highest paying legal job I can, which you know doesn't sound like a horrible thing, but I absolutely hated it. I worked for one of these New York mega firms, and from day one, I just knew I made a horrible mistake. Um, hung on for two years. By that point, I knew a little about how people went about breaking into TV and film, which was my deep, dark secret. This is what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I was really at a crossroads. I was almost 30, and I just said, it's now or never. I gotta really make this happen. I quit my job. I told everybody I was leaving and going to LA to be a writer. And, you know, people said, well, let me get this straight. You, you went to auto mechanic school. You graduate. <laughs> you, you work your way through college. You, you then become a lawyer, you're, you pass the bar exam in New York City, you're on partnership track at a major Manhattan law firm. You're quitting that to move to Los Angeles where you've never been before to write scripts 
and you've never written a script before. That's your plan. I said, yes, that's my plan. <laughs> I know I'm right. And uh, everybody, you know, even though they didn't say it to my face, said, all right, he'll be back in six months. And I just, I never looked back. I went to LA, I started writing. So did you know anybody? Not you know? a soul. Mm -hmm. No, I just, I, I like parachuted out of the plane, landed there. It was great because I took myself out of my comfort zone. I was in this strange city. I didn't know anyone. I just, every morning I'd wake up and I'd go, what the fuck am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be a writer. <laughs> and I would write. It was just that terror of, you've got to make this happen. It wasn't like, you know, okay, well maybe tomorrow I'll start working on that script. It was now. So you were writing spec scripts. Yeah, yeah. spec sitcom scripts, yeah. only because they were short. I, I kind of yeah. thought I could get my head around the story that played out in 23 minutes. The idea of writing something that took an hour or a movie, forget it. You know, just. But I understood the sitcom form, and I used to tape episodes of Home Improvement, I'm dating myself, I would tape them. And, uh, and I would watch them and I, I dissect them. I mean, you ever hear about kids who grow up to be electrical engineers and they get a radio and they take it apart, put it back together? I was doing that with TV shows. I would watch, I'd write down what happened in each scene and I would create an outline based on what I saw and then I'd say, oh, I, I get what they're doing here. The, uh, you know, the second scene back from the commercial, Tim Allen talks to the guy over the backyard fence. They do this every episode. And I started to teach myself story structure and just kept plugging away and created a phony agency and got my work out there. Creative. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to create a phony uh, talent agency. Phony. You had a phony agent. I, yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, was, I was not, I was just, there was no, nothing was going to stop me. I just, every day we were living on that. I was working as a paralegal. I had oh. to take my law degree off my resume. I didn't oh. get a job. I just needed a paralegal job. I took my law degree off my resume, and I was working for a big oil company in Los Angeles, uh, in, the, in their department. And I, I, we've done some research where it's obviously against the law to say you're a lawyer if you're not a lawyer. I couldn't find any case law that, that said it's even <laughs> <laughs> so I just needed a nine to five job so I could come home and write at night. So I'm working as a paralegal, and my boss thought I was the smartest paralegal in history. <laughs> he kept offering to write me recommendation letters for law school, and I was like, ah, <laughs> I had no idea I was a writer, trying to be a writer, and, uh, you know, so I was just that paying my bills, and I was, I shared an apartment, I had roommates, and I just, every night before I went to bed, I said, what did you do today to make your writing career happen? And if I couldn't say, I wrote a scene, I sent out a script, I'd get my ass out of bed and do something. So I said, at least I can go to bed with the peace of mind of saying, you are trying, you are trying to get one inch closer to what you want. And it took me three, almost exactly three years, and I got hired on a show. Well, this is really a passion story. You're passionate about doing this. Yeah, you, yeah. We're not going to be denied. Right. Now, but when you started, you obviously had to take any job you could get, right? Yes. And so, let's hear some of the jobs you took. The first job I got, like, I got, I was lucky enough to get into the well, Warner Brothers Sitcom Writers Workshop, uh, which really a godsend. There, there are, as many of you may know, almost no clear-cut paths to doing this for a living. You know, if you said you wanted to be a dentist, I'd say, okay, great, go to dental school, get an you know, internship, get a license, bang, you're a dentist. I want to be a writer, how do I do that? Well, write a script, then what? I have no idea. <laughs> get a job, how do you do that? No idea. Get, someone get an to agent, read the script. how do you get an well, agent? Yeah. The script. Impossible. Yeah. So you, 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 at least early on, there's 50% uh, talent and 50% tenacity, maybe, maybe more, uh, because right. you've got to get, no one ever rang my doorbell and asked to read a script of mine. You've got to get it out there. So Warner Brothers does this program and they, they take like 15 people a year and they put you through this 10-week process and the idea being that you know, it'll, you'll get put on one of their sitcoms. So at the end of it, they called me and they said, we have an interesting situation. We have a show we think you might be good for, not a sitcom, which no reflection on your sitcom writing. But it's, uh, so why me? They said, well, it's about a blue collar guy who's a lawyer who goes to work for a really stuffy law firm. Do you think you could write that? <laughs> said, yeah, probably. And uh, I remember leaving for the end of the day. They, they, they did, no. yeah, they did. And uh, I thought, if I don't get this fucking job, <laughs> I'm not going to do something else, right? So uh, this has to be it, right? It was it. It was co-created by a guy named Frank Rizzoli and also uh, the writing team George Skank and Frank Cardia, who had done a show called Crazy Like a Fox in the 80s. And it was called The Great Defender. It was on Fox. We only ran for like eight or ten episodes, but that was my first show. Uh, and after that, you know, did again... Did you get a script on? I did get a script, yeah. And, and, um, it was great. I mean, it was it was an incredible experience. They were just incredible mentors, and Frank and I became really close friends. Uh, after that, you know, and again, I, again, based on my naivete more than anything, I didn't know, I didn't think about plotting a career or you got to be very careful about what shows you take. My standards for taking a job were, were really high. You had to ask me. <laughs> and the next day, well, yeah, pay me. I was like, great. I couldn't believe I was in Los Angeles and getting paid to write things for a living. I, I still can't. 
And then it was just, I mean, I got a writer's little card. It was like the happiest thing in my life. I was like, I'm really, because I, I, one of the early days in, in Hollywood, I met a guy at a party, and um, I would never identify myself as a writer. And I met this guy, and I said, he, he said he's a producer. And I said, what have you produced? He said, well, nothing. <laughs> and I, he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an astronaut. <laughs> I haven't been to the moon yet. <laughs> I said, I can't. I mean, why would you introduce yourself as, as unless I said, until I'm making a living at this, I can't really say I'm a writer, and finally I was. So um, I, the second job offer, as, as The Great Defender was ending, um, there's a guy named R.J. Stewart, who was one of the writers, and uh, he said, you know, I've got this show that I'm developing with Sam Raimi and Rob Tapper. It's called Xena Warrior Princess. And right. I said, great. So um, I called my agent. I had a real agent by this time. <laughs> and he said, Xena Warrior Princess? Are you kidding me? I said, he thinks it's going to be a big hit. He's like, Terry. Because I got a show for you. Because you know Flipper the Dolphin? Yeah, everybody knows Flipper. Exactly. Nobody knows Xena Warrior Princess. Don't, don't do that. So I said, all right, so I called RJ. So, you know, they're doing the new adventures of Flipper. So I did a couple of freelance episodes of Xena, which, if, you, if you're a fan of the show, you go on one of the fan sites. My episodes are the, consistently the lowest rated Xena episode. I didn't know a thing about fantasy, or that that is just absolutely not my world at all. I didn't know anything about dolphins either, by the way. But, uh, I, I just, I had a really hard time writing that stuff, and then it showed. I mean, I think it really, really showed. But Flipper was no walk in the park either. Um, we had 22 episodes, and um, there are exactly 10 stories in the world that are that organically involve dolphins. <laughs> you find the 10th one, and then you're in a writer's room looking at each other going, what the fuck do we do now? <laughs> A story that has to involve a dolphin. You know, it's it was really one of the longest years of my life. But I was thrilled to have a job. And from there it was, you know, again, you know, sister sister. because uh, I wanted to be a sitcom writer. My agent said, All right, well, I can get you on a sitcom, you know, it might not be a great sitcom to start with, but yeah, I I didn't care. And again, it, it, by this time I was starting to realize that people were looking at my resume and going, What the <laughs> And uh, but from my uh, you know, point of view it was well, I'm a writer, I can write anything. But People don't see the world like that. Um, years later, I was on a show called The PJs, uh, which is an animated claymation show, uh, foam nation show. We talked a lot of Fox right. with Eddie Murphy. Uh, it was really good. Yeah. And uh, my agent called me up and he said, I want to send you something. It's uh, a show called The Sopranos, the pilot episode. Like everybody else, I thought, opera, why right. me? But, you know, oh. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> so I watched it, and about 20 minutes into it, I thought this was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And I, I kind of grew up around guys like this in Brooklyn. I worked for a butcher shop that was owned by Paul Castellano, who was the yeah. head of the Gambino yes. family. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of knew how these guys talked and acted and thought. And I called my agent, and I said, you've got to get me on this show. He said, all right, well, so I said, no, listen, you have got to get me on this show. I, I know this is the show for me. The second call was to Frank Rizzulli, who co-created The Great Defender. Frank grew up in Boston uh, in a very similar environment, and it turned out he was he already had a meeting scheduled with David Chase the following Friday. David, it turned out that Frank was the last person David hired, and he had his first year staff ready, so I sort of sat on the sidelines. What David didn't know is that the whole first season, Frank was sending me scripts, and I was editing with him and talking about stories, and I was sort of You're on, on the staff, staff but not real. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, all that year, we worked on a spec uh, script that I thought would be a good sample for The Sopranos. And um, I wrote it, I was really proud of it, and Frank got it to David, and I thought, oh, this is great, he'll read it, he'll see I'm the right guy for the show. He read it and he hated it. <laughs> and Frank said, yeah, I, he, he just doesn't like it. And I was, I was crushed, and uh, I thought, I'm really goes my shot. And then finally, um, season two came along, David had essentially cleaned house on the writing staff, kept Frank and writing team Robin Green and Mitch Burgess, and finally said, right, you really think this guy can write the show? And Frank said, I, I'm positive he can write the show. And David hired me to do a script, it was basically an audition, and um, that it worked one he out. Liked. Yeah, he liked that one, and then I was on the show. And, uh, and working with David, uh, yeah. beyond, I obviously must have learned a ton yes. of working with him, but you know, he had the reputation of being a guy who literally you know, had his hands on everything, and, mm -hmm. and really totally ran a show. Yeah, and was incredibly demanding, right? Yes, and yes. and that turns out to be a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah, very specific. Yeah, I mean, David. I mean, there were nights when I'd be on the set, and uh, yeah, it'd be eleven o'clock at night, and David would call, and he'd say, uh, "The guy uh, we hired to play the cop, uh, he has one line. He said, does he still have that mustache?" And I'm honest. <laughs> 
Yeah, just tell him to shave it and hang out. Like, <laughs> whether or not the guy that has a mustache, I mean, it was just an amazing detail, the level of detail, and uh, it was great. So, would you get, show. would you break, when they broke story, would you get like, a certain episode, let's, here, here's the season, and we'll break the stories, and Terry will write episode three, or? Not in, not in the beginning. What we would do, and it was smart, uh, you know, if we had five writers, for example, we would break five episodes completely. Nobody knew who was going to write anything. The idea being, if you knew you were going to write episode three, once you got past episode three, you're sort of thinking about your own episode and not fully invested in everything as if it could be yours. So we never really uh, assigned anything until we had enough to go around. And then at that point, they would say, okay, does anybody have a particular affinity for anything? If it was something you pitched, for example, right. and you really felt strongly about, um, he would let you state your case and he'd think about it and either agree or disagree. Or sometimes he'd just say, go do it. Um, but you would really pitch send it. All the writers would pitch David. Right. And he would think about storylines and know that won't work. No, that yeah. Won't work, that won't work. Yeah, it's just a lot of sitting around a table <coughs> talking, what about this, what about that? And ninety percent of it gets thrown out the window. Um, right. it's just the, the way it, it goes. And a lot of digression, it's a lot of just storytelling. It's you know, you never it, you know, to the untrained eye you sit in a writer's room, probably any writer's room, and it's it's just a bunch of people bullshitting. Right. And it is a lot of that. But but eventually sometimes, you know, on Sopranos a month or two would go by and David would call me and say, what was that story you told me about your grandmother? Mm -hmm. And when would that go again? And they'd tell it to me and then it would show up in an outline. Yeah. And you never know, it was all grist for the mill. And you know, part of the job is to really um, open your veins and spill them out on, on screen for the world. I mean, there's tons of things on, on Boardwalk and on Sopranos that came from my life and all the other writers' lives that were really, you know, some, some embarrassing, some painful, but that's, the job. I mean, we would you say, and I say, to my own writers, you've got to. This is sort of like a, th a therapist's office. You, once that door closes, you you need to be able to say anything you want in here. It, really express yourself in every. You're writing a show about some really ugly behavior, so I want to hear every horrible, <laughs> sexist, racist, stupid thing you've ever thought, said, or done, dreamt about. You know, it's it's okay. You know, this is what we're talking about. These are the people we're writing about. And, um, I had um, been in a fight with a girlfriend once that, that culminated with her hitting me in the head with a piece of London broil. That had been like the you know. That's, that's a very minor example, but yeah. it's that's the job. I mean, to really mine the depths of your own personal pain and. You know. Well, you wrote, I would say, to, to my mind, the second most discussed episode in Sopranos history. Uh, the finale is number one, I guess, right. and the other one is the Pine Barrens. Right, right, which, right. Which Chase was asked about in every conversation I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. About that episode. Right. And it was truly different and unusual and and stood out almost like a little film. Yeah. And, and I just wonder about the genesis. Well, first we should say the plot a little bit of it. Sure. Tell us about the genesis yeah. of it. Uh, the plot was uh, Paulie and Christopher uh, had to go and collect some money from a Russian gangster uh, on behalf of Silvio, who was sick. So they go to collect the money. Paulie gets into a fight with the guy. Uh, they kill him. They throw his body in the trunk of a car. They get him out to the middle of the woods in New Jersey, and uh, they're just going to bury him. They open the trunk. It turns out he's not dead. It also turns out that the guy is an ex-Russian commando. They bring him into the woods, he gets the best of them, knocks them out, runs into the woods, they chase him, they shoot him, they hit him, but the guy keeps running and gets away. Anyway, long story short, they get lost in the woods. These are two city guys <laughs> in the and leather jackets, now they're lost in the snow in the woods, and they're there all night, and they slowly start to turn on each other, and it's this little movie that plays out over 24 hours. The genesis of that was um, Todd Kessler, who was a writer on The Sopranos at the time, uh, went on to create Damages. He and I were sitting in the room just bullshitting, talking about story ideas, and one of our directors, uh, the phenomenal Tim Van Patten, just got off the elevator. And uh, Tim is now one of the executive producers on Warwick Empire with me and our, our main director. So he got off, he was prepping an episode, and he said, what are you guys doing? And I said, oh, we're just talking about stories. He said, I have an idea for a story. I actually have a dream. I said, what is it? He said, that's stupid. I said, well, can't be any dumber than what we're talking about. Why don't you tell me? So he said, I had a dream that Paul and Christopher took the guy into the woods and tried to kill him, and then he got lost. I said, that's brilliant. That's yeah. great. I said, go, go tell David. He said he was too shy. He goes, ah, I don't have to tell David. I said, I'm telling David that. I'll, I'll tell him it's your idea. But I, so I walked in there. I said, David, listen to this. So I told him the idea. And he said, great, let's do it. This was actually in season two. But as it was plotting out, we didn't really have room to do it. He said, you know, we'll do it next year. And as season three developed, it just 
plotted out and we stuck it, I think it was the ninth episode of that year. And um, the other thing too, coincidentally, is you know, you hire your directors well in advance. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, Steve Buscemi was hired for the mm -hmm. first time to direct an episode with us. It was gonna be episode nine, whatever that turned out to be. But as it turned out, it turned out to be Pine Barrens, and that's how I first met, first Steve. met Steve. And um, mm -hmm. it's funny, people thought, and they thought, oh, it's this Fargo connection. And, mm -hmm. It, we didn't even know it was going to snow. When I wrote the script, it wasn't supposed to take place in the snow. It was almost very cold. Right. And we prepped the episode right before Christmas, and we, the last thing we said was, okay, well, as long as it doesn't snow, we'll be fine. And of course, there's this massive blizzard over the holidays. And um, we didn't even know if we were going to be able to get our trucks out there. And as it turned out, it was, it, it, was amped up the, the, yeah. it amped it up by 40%. Yeah. Suddenly, now they're in the middle of nowhere, in the woods, in the snow. Everything looks exactly the same. Actually, in the first shot on the show, when they're marching the Russian guy into the woods, he's sort of catching snowflakes on his tongue. That was the last bit of snowfall from that blizzard. And it ended the morning we started filming, and we filmed for four days out there, and then uh, came home. But it was just really one of these incredible, happy coincidences. And so you and Steve established your relationship. Yeah, we became friends, and I had been a huge fan of his as an actor. Uh, and then I got to know his director. Um, the first before he was in the show. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. in as a friend. No, he, we hired him a couple of times as a director, and I, I kept getting lucky. I kept drawing the straw where Steve was said he was going to direct. So I think he directed three episodes of mine. We became friends, and um, then we cast him in a role as role uh, as Tony's cousin on the show for a year. Uh, and then uh, he and I kept in touch, and when Boardwalk came around, uh, when it came time to cast the series, Mark Scorsese and I just, and again, because people didn't really know anything about the real Nucky, we weren't married to what the guy looked like, so Marty just said, let's just get, let's pick the best actor, who, who are great actors we want to work with, and I said, Steve Buscemi for me, and he said, wow, that's a great idea, I, I love Steve, I worked with him briefly, I'd love to work with him again. We kind of put a pin in it, and a week later, Marty called me up and he said, I can't stop thinking about Steve Buscemi, and I said, I can't either. And we called HBO, they said, great, let's do it. And so, so Scorsese's involvement, how did that begin? And be, you, you read the book. Uh, yeah, HBO way wanted before you that, that though. Developed. Okay, before that. Yeah, okay. the, the, during The Departed. Mark Wahlberg, uh, who many of you may know, is partnered with a guy named Steve Levinson, and they produce Entourage for HBO. Mark was in The Departed with Marty and was talking to Marty about TV and telling him about the, the success and the fun they've had doing Entourage. And he said to Marty, would you ever do a TV show? And Marty said, yeah, it was the right thing, of course. So Mark called Steve Levinson and said, we got to find a project for Mark Scorsese. I'm pretty sure it was Ari Emanuel, who's Mark's agent and Marty's agent, who gave them the book, uh, Boardwalk Empire, and said, what about this thing? They gave the book to Marty. He said, yeah, this is interesting. HBO said, great, let's find a writer. And they called me and said, take a look at this book. And it all came from there. So it was all right, we're going to have the audience ask a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask you a couple of quick things. The set, it's an amazing set. Uh, it's actually a, a real boardwalk-looking yep. set. And it's in a... It's in a parking place. lot in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, uh, right on the water. It's 300 feet long. It's the size of a football field. Uh -huh. Largest standing set in New York film history, uh, I believe, since uh, the dawn of silent film. And I, I wanted to ask you about where you stand on uh, HBO Go and making it available online if you have an opinion. I like it. I, like I don't it. really understand the question. You don't understand. Okay, so, so <laughs> if it's so HBO related, I'm all for it. So, so <laughs> a, lot of young, a lot of young people who don't get cable yes. and uh, don't want to get cable yeah. uh, have started this thing, Take My Money HBO. Do I get residuals out of this? I like it. <laughs> I, get, I get some extra viewers, I guess. But, they want to have access to HBO shows, even though they right. Don't. So they want to, yeah. They want to pay for it, but they want to pay for it online. I think that's great. No, I mean I think that anything that gets the show out there and just exposes it to more people. I mean, selfishly as an artist, I think that's great. I don't know if that's the right answer. I'll have to call the heads of HBO and tell them how am I supposed to answer this. But I think I like it. Okay. But I might not. Like it. <laughs> You're certainly right. Yes. That's, that's a lawyer. I might hate it. <laughs>